Hi, I'm Kendrick Johnson, and I'm a third-year medical student at Toro University. Today I'm going to talk for a second about valve disease. So the content of this is directed towards third- and fourth-year medical students who are studying for the boards and awards, and uh, it is intended to be a, a review and not to take place of uh, studying the uh, textbook. So valve diseases, anything that goes wrong with a valve could be considered a valve disease. But most often when we talk about valvular diseases, we're talking about uh, prolapse and regurgitation. So uh, this can happen in any of the four valves of the heart. We're going to talk specifically about mitral valve prolapse and regurg, mitral uh, stenosis, aortic reg regurg, aortic stenosis, and just touch on tricuspid and pulmonary valve disease. Endocarditis I had on this list, but I'm not going to talk about it specifically. Just remember that with almost any of these diseases, endocarditis can be a precipitating factor. So when somebody comes into the office and uh, we do a physical exam, we auscultate at the, at the four uh, traditional points for auscultation of the heart. Um, on the right side, below the second rib, right next to the sternum, we have the aortic valve listening post. Uh, just across from that we have pulmonic. And then down if you go under the fifth rib, uh, next to the sternum on the left, then you have the tricuspid valve uh, listening post. And then uh, also underneath the fifth rib, but uh, closer to the, nip the nipple, uh, some people say midclavicular line, you have the mitral valve uh, listening post. So this is going to be relevant, uh, especially on a test where uh, they're asking you to identify a murmur or identify a, a disease based on a murmur, or at least using a murmur. So aortic pathology, at least for a test, is going to be found at the aortic listening spot, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So though that might not be as clinical clinically useful in real life because in real life we're going to be using an echo to diagnose all of these that uh, may be useful on the board. So at the aortic listening post, if you hear a systolic murmur, then you got to think about uh, what's happening at the aortic valve during systole. So during systole, uh, the aortic valve is uh, is um, <laughs> there's there's a lot of uh, blood going through the aortic aortic valve during systole because that's when we're pumping. So if you have a murmur during systole uh, for at the aortic listening spot, then we've got uh, some kind of a stenosis because it's making noise when it's going through the valve. So and then if you have a uh, noise during diastole, well, you know there's not really supposed to be g anything going through the valve during diastole, so it's going to be a regurgitation. And that goes for the other valves as well. And uh, on board questions, that can be uh, pretty much all you need to diagnose it. But like I say, in real life, you're probably going to hear something. If You may not be able to spot, uh, to tell exactly which spot it's loudest and you're going to do an echocardiogram and, and make the diagnosis that way. So mitral valve prolapse is a pretty common one. A lot of people say that this is something you see in young women, uh, primarily thin young women. The statistics don't really support that. It's, it's going to be equal in, in young men and women. But uh, it's usually an incidental finding because it's uh, most often asymptomatic. But these people can have some symptoms. They can have uh, you know, a little bit of shortness of breath, even some chest pain. But uh, most of the time, you probably just found it, find it with a stethoscope. So what does it sound like? I, I tried to make a, recreate a, a little diagram here of what it sounds like. Really, you ought to go on YouTube and just search for mitral valve prolapse murmur. There's a few good videos. I tried to find uh, the best ones. Um, and I really wanted to, to paste them into this video, but I couldn't really find uh, a good source to do that.
but it, it's easy enough to go on and just search for mitral valve prolapse and then you'll be able to hear that mid systolic click and sometimes with a late systolic murmur if there's going to be uh, regurgitation in in a lot of these though there's no regurg so you won't ha hear that uh, late systolic murmur um and if if you do then you're probably getting into a more symptomatic case of mitral valve prolapse so you diagnose this with, with clinical findings and uh, uh, confirm it with an echo. Like I say, since it's asymptomatic in most cases, it's probably just going to be uh, an incidental finding, and you may or may not get an echo to make sure. And uh, you, know, you don't need to treat it. Most of the time it's going to not have any problems, but it, later on you might have to treat it if it ends up with a, a serious regurgitation which we'll talk about now. So the main causes of mitral valve regurgitation are mitral valve prolapse, like we just talked about, rheumatic fever, papillary muscle dysfunction, and endocarditis. And if you don't do anything about it, um, you, can, you can just picture the left atrium is going to have an increase of pressure. So the mitral valve is the valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle. If that uh, valve is leaky, then every time you squeeze the left ventricle, you're going to get uh, re regurgitation back up into the atrium. So that's going to have an increase of pressure in the atrium, and that can cause dilation, and then we, we back up that pressure even further into the lungs, and you get pulmonary edema. So if that's not kept in check, uh, then uh, you, you could end up getting uh, some, some serious pulmonary edema and eventually core pulmonale. So it's something you want to you make sure you take care of. It's going to sound like a high-pitched uh, apical holosystolic murmur radiating to, to the axilla. So when I say apical holosystolic murmur, remember back at the listening post, that little M is down at the apex of the heart. That's where you, that's where you hear most mitral uh, pathology. So you also get a laterally displaced uh, uh, PMI, and uh, this is going to be, again, confirmed with echo, which, which all of these will be. I might stop talking about the diagnosis because uh, in all of them you're going to confirm with echo. And uh, in order to treat it, um, ACE inhibitors, vasodilators, uh, diuretics, and surgery. So the main idea is if you've got uh, uh, this extra um, this extra pressure um, going backwards, if we can reduce the systemic pressure, then um, more of that uh, is going to go uh, out through the aorta instead of back up into the atrium. So ACE inhibitors and vasodilators and diuretics all serve that purpose. In some cases, uh, we do surgery, which uh, could include um, narrowing the opening so we get uh, less blood uh, soaking, seeping back through into the atrium. Mitral stenosis is primarily caused by rheumatic fever. And this used to be uh, uh, more common when we had more cases of rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever used to be the number one cause of uh, valve problems, um, but it, it isn't any longer because we've, uh, we found antibiotics. So the complications that can come from this are uh, left atrial involvement, um, so this is a uh, this is a little bit different than the uh, left atrial enlargement that we saw um, with uh, mitral uh, regurg, because now um, we have an increase of pressure uh, butting up against that uh, mitral valve. So so it's harder for um, for blood to get down into the left atrium. So we've got the right heart pumping blood through the lungs and into that left atrium, and uh, it's not getting into um, 
it's not getting into the left ventricle as quickly as it should. So uh, following that same logic, you, s you get right heart failure because the right heart is, is having to work harder in order to get the blood where it needs to go. So with these people, you see shortness of breath, uh, you see orthopnea. Um, in some cases, you get uh, hemoptysis because of the, uh, the pulmonary hypertension. And of course, you get pulmonary edema. Atrial fibrillation comes with any time that you're going to enlarge the atrium. So we could have seen that with the mitral regurge as well. So for treatment, um, I'm going to be honest here and say that I, I'm not quite sure about this. <laughs> I read the, I read the up-to-date article um, because uh, in the review material I was looking at, it said to never give uh, inotropes. But uh, I've always understood uh, digoxin to be an inotrope. So um, it, it lists in the review material that you give beta blockers, uh, digoxin, anticoagulants, and valve replacement. So uh, the beta blockers you can, of course, understand for the same reason we just talked about. If we are able to uh, decrease the amount of work that the heart has to do, then um, you'll get less heart failure. And uh, uh, the digoxin, I actually don't really understand how that would fit. Anticoagulants, because um, you uh, can get clotting around the stenosis with any of these. You can get, get blood clots. And uh, valve replacement, um, of course, to, to create a valve that works better. And then, of course, if you do do a valve replacement, then you for sure anticoagulate for life because there's a severe clotting risk there. And uh, to take a look at uh, what it's going to sound like, so if it's, a, if it's a mitral stenosis, that means that the little opening going from the left atrium to the left ventricle is going to be narrow. So when does blood go through that? Well, it goes through during diastole. That's when you're filling the left ventricle. So if, uh, if that process is slowed down or if, if you have a narrow opening, that's when you hear the murmur and that's going to be happening um, during diastole. So aortic regurge can be caused by endocarditis, rheumatic fever, uh, ventricular septal defect, congenital bicuspid aorta, this is one of the ones that you will see uh, appearing later in life if you have a, a congenital bicuspid aorta, which uh, also can result in uh, aortic stenosis. Tertiary syphilis can cause this, as well as aortic dissection and Marfan's, as well as tra trauma. So uh, lots, lots of things can cause this, but uh, the overlying idea is that uh, we are losing the effectiveness of the uh, valve to close. So you can understand endocarditis, rheumatic fever, we're disrupting the leaflets there of the valve. Uh, Marfan syndrome, you get aortic uh, root dilation, so uh, you end up having a, a, a bigger hole, uh, but not more valve in order to f uh, cover the hole. So the, the main idea is just that uh, we, we don't have a valve that closes. This is the one that uh, is classically associated with uh, some pretty interesting findings. I'm going to pull out my cheap sheet here because I don't remember uh, what all these different eponyms are. Give me one second to pull that out. But the, the main uh, feature here is that you have to you have to push real hard um, to counteract uh, this aortic regurgitation because you're going to squirt all the blood up and then it's just going to fall back down in to the left ventricle. So you get these uh, uh, you get these uh, characteristic findings like the water hammer pulse. It's uh, characterized by a wide pulse pressure. Again, you have to really squirt a, a bunch of water or a bunch of blood up into the aorta 
and uh, a lot of it's going to drip back down so you have a, a big difference between your systolic pressure and your diastolic pressure. There's a Traub sign which uh, is a, a pistol shot brewy over the femoral pulse so you, you hear just a lot of blood squirting by when you're listening to the uh, femoral artery. Corrigan's pulse is an unusually large carotid pulsation so you'll be able to you'll be able to see uh, the carotid pulse. Quinky sign is a pulsatile blanching and reddening of fingernails upon light pressure. So uh, you know when we blanch the the fingernails to check for capillary refill, if we just give a light pressure on the end of the finger, then you can see uh, blood kind of squirting into the the fingertips there. Demuset sign. I'm not sure how that one's supposed to be pronounced, but that's a that's the head bobbing. Um, where the carotid pulse is so vigorous that uh, you see people's head bob uh, due to the pressure. And then, uh, let's see, Muller's sign is a uh, pulse-style bobbing of the uvula. So you look in their mouth and you, you can see the li their little hangy ball jumping up and down. And DeRosie's sign is a to-and-fro murmur over the femoral artery. It's heard best with mild pressure applied to the artery. So um, you diagnose this is the same way as you do all the others with a with an echo, and then you treat it um, by decreasing afterload. So ACE inhibitors and vasodilators. I think we've said that on all of the these so far. That basically, if we decrease afterload, then uh, we're gonna we're gonna be able to. Uh, avoid some of the symptoms of, of valve disease. You also do uh, uh, va antibiotic prophylaxis before you do any kind of a uh, dental procedure uh, or, or surgery. So uh, b the reason for this is because you have a valve that's compromised and it's uh, susceptible to infection. And then you do a, a valve replacement in the uh, serious cases, and in fact, uh, probably more often than not, you're gonna you're gonna want a valve disease with aortic regurg. So the opposite of aortic regurgitation is aortic stenosis, and this can be congenital rheumatic fever, or it can also be just associated with age. I mentioned before the bicuspid uh, aortic valves. Uh, those those are uh, tend to get calcified and uh, lead to aortic stenosis with age. So there's a, a classic triad associated with the aortic stenosis, uh, syncope, angina, and exertional dyspnea. So that's the classic triad, quote-unquote. Um, it sounds to me a lot like, uh, um, like an MI as well. So uh, syncope and angina with exertional uh, a history of exertional disp dyspnea. That sounds like uh, an MI too. So, so these people are going to get the full workup anyway. Um, but this is uh, the classic triad for aortic stenosis. So, um, the treatment uh, is is basically surgery. There are other options, but they're mostly just when you have a poor surgical candidate. So you can do a mechanical. Uh, valve or you can do a bioprosthesis. You could do like a, a, a pig valve. And uh, I don't know the benefits to, to one or the other. Um, personally, I'd go for the pig valve. That sounds cooler. Um, a poor surgical uh, candidate might get a balloon valvuloplasty. If you got a constriction of the valve, uh, it makes sense to stick a balloon up there and inflate it and so the valve gets stretched out. Endocarditis prophylaxis, again, uh, because we've got a, a spot where infection likes to grow. And then this says, uh, never give beta blockers to aortic stenosis patients. So these people are working pretty hard already just to get the blood out to the body. And so if you give a beta blocker, you're going to slow down the heart um, as well as uh, decrease contractility of the heart. And uh, they're not going to get enough blood. Uh, out to the uh, brain, kidneys, etc. 
so these people can go into shock if you give them a beta blocker. And uh, as you can imagine, in aortic stenosis, uh, the aortic valve has blood going through it during dia or di during uh, systole, and so if it's stenosed, then you get uh, a pretty loud sound, a little pretty loud murmur, um, all throughout systole. Oh, I forgot I was gonna do. Uh, I was going to make my own heart sounds for you. So this would be a whoosh, 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 whoosh. You probably aren't going to hear uh, S1 and S2 because uh, the murmur is pretty loud. This is just a note on tricuspid and pulmonary valve disease. Um, they both can be caused by carcinoid syndrome. They both can be caused by endocarditis. When we think about uh, tricuspid valve disease, we often think about uh, IV drug abusers because they're sticking stuff into their into their veins, and that's going uh, first to the uh, the tricuspid valve is going to be the first valve that that those little uh, disease causing pathogens are going to hit. Uh, generally, it's going to be uh, Staph aureus, Staph epidermidis. Um, causing the endocarditis and the tricuspid valve. But uh, carcinoid syndrome also causes uh, a fibrosis of both of these valves. Tricuspid stenosis, you hear a diastolic rumble. Tricuspid regurg is uh, holosystolic. And uh, look for a jugular systolic pulsation. So I didn't mean to skip over. Um, with tricuspid stenosis, it uh, sounds a lot like a mitral stenosis. Uh, again, we're we're doing this is these valves are kind of acting at the same time, and so uh, so they're going to sound like each other if they both have if one or the other of them sounds like stenosis. Sorry, if one or the other one has a uh, has a murmur, but the uh, tricuspid stenosis is going to be louder in inspiration. So if you think about that, when you uh, when you take a deep breath, you are uh, decreasing the pressure. Um, just kidding. It doesn't really make sense to me. So you can think about that on your own. Pulmonary regurge, um, you get the gram steel murmur, which is just a diastolic murmur at the left sternal border. Remember the left sternal border fifth intercostal space, I mean, sorry, this second intercostal space is uh, the pulmonary listening spot. Um, with, th with these, you can do balloon valvuloplasties. It's rare to do a valve replacement on either the tricuspid or pulmonary valves. So uh, the, the pictures um, of the uh, murmurs were taken from Wikipedia. Um, there's a, a Creative Commons license on them. But uh, please give me your comments on the video. Again, it's uh, intended for medical students uh, studying for the boards. So uh, if there's anything important that you think I left out or any uh, problems, uh, errors, please uh, leave a comment or send me an email at kendrick at com. Thanks.